Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the shape of DNA, belongs in the company of Galileo, Darwin, and Einstein in the pantheon of scientists, according to science journalist Matt Ridley. Mr. Ridley is with me now to look into Crick's life and work, and what made him great. He's the author of a new book called Francis Crick, part of HarperCollins' Eminent Live series. I'm pleased to welcome him to the Leonard Lopez Show today. It's great to be here. You call Francis Crick a genius? Is that well, right? Uh, I don't think that's quite the right word because uh, I don't think he was uh, supremely brilliant himself necessarily, although he was very clever. Uh, but the, the, the quality of his discoveries, uh, the discovery not just of the double helix but what came after, the genetic code and all that, does stand, in my view, as one of the great moments in all of science. And therefore, for that reason, he's up there in the pantheon with those people you mentioned. And, and, and you come to writing a biography of him, and do you find that this was sort of surprising in his own life that he made such discoveries? Was he a prodigy from the start? How did he get come to this? One of the remarkable things about him is that until the age of 35, he was mediocrity personified. So he lends a lot of hope for, for people if they don't feel they've achieved anything in the first 35 years of their life. And that's that, I'm exaggerating that a bit. He, he, he was a perfectly uh, competent scientist and, and war, um, uh, uh, war scientist. He worked on weapons during the war and so on. But he arrives in biology, uh, doesn't really make a great splash, uh, rubs people up the wrong way, Everybody thinks he talks too much. He doesn't doesn't uh, do enough, and so on. Uh, and then suddenly there are these fifteen brilliant years in which he leads and and, and shapes a revolution in, in biology that that really goes to the heart of what life is and why why it, why it is, and then ends up with a full explanation: the genetic code, not only for how life duplicates itself, but also how it grows and moves, i.e., um, metabolism, which is written in this code. And how do you account for that sudden? 15 year burst something clicked what clicked was it was it his partnership with watson was it his his great secret was as you hint there that he worked very well in what i call a dyad um a pairing of course there's a there's a wonderful symbolism there because the double helix is, mm -hmm. is is a pairing in itself um and he needed someone like watson uh, to bounce ideas off. It was later in, in his career, it was Sidney Brenner and then more recently Christoph Koch um, at Caltech who he did all his uh, consciousness work with. Um, he thought through conversation. He actually needed to be talking to people all day in order to be able to develop his ideas. Um, he was incredibly hard working as well um, and he had an extraordinary ability to sort of visualize things in three dimensions which startled some people. That was as it were the nature of what made him a, a great scientist but it was this it was this um, this long-running continuation with a friend where he would float a stupid idea, the friend could float a stupid idea, didn't matter if it was stupid uh, as long as the other person didn't mind saying it was stupid. And so they had a lot of fun, they bounced ideas off famously that Watson and Crick end up you know, in the pub the whole time um, arguing till, uh, well not till late into the night but certainly most of the day as far as you can make out and, mm. uh, and this is, this is you know, it, it's not a solitary intelligence in other words and that's why it doesn't sort of sound like scientific genius, if you know what I mean. It's not someone locked away in an ivory tower having a brilliant thought. Now, were there others at the time uh, who, other labs elsewhere uh, or others even in England who were, who were honing in on this? Was this, a, as is often the case with major discoveries, something that was on the brink of happening and it was just a, a race? Who was going to get there? Well, in the case of the double helix, absolutely. There's no question it would have been discovered very, very soon afterwards. Uh, Francis Crick once wrote an article in which he started uh, by saying if Jim Watson had been killed by a tennis ball, because Watson was often going off to play tennis, um, who would have discovered the structure of DNA? I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have been me because I wouldn't have paid enough attention without Watson there, uh, but who would it? Um, he thought the answer was Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling in, 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 at Caltech in California had made one uh, 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 stab at, at the structure and had got it wrong, would have soon realized he was on the wrong track and would have started again. Um, I personally think Morris Wilkins is actually the person who would have done it at King's College London. He was about to start model building. He'd started the whole business of taking the photographs. But, of course, the person who had all the pieces of puzzle in her hand and didn't put them together was Rosalind Franklin. And her unlucky thing is that she was leaving the project. She'd, she'd, she'd had her go and she was giving it up. But if she'd just been able to talk to someone like Francis Crick who could have helped her with the theory a bit, it, 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 would, have, it would have been entirely her discovery. Now, Crick had, as you say, started out in war science, and he had been involved in designing magnetic mines. Tell, 
Tell me, what are magnetic mines? Well, a magnetic mine, which was apparently invented in the First World War by the British, but the, at the beginning of the Second World War, the Germans used it very successfully to shut down a lot of British shipping. They drop them from aeroplanes, they sit on the seabed, uh, they go off when a ship goes over them because of the distortion in the Earth's magnetic field. Um, uh, what Crick ended up doing, he, he was originally hired to design countermeasures to these things, but he ended up working much more offensively on, on British magnetic mines, and he invented a mine that would, sm- that would sink a minesweeper. Um, so it was a specially insensitive magnetic mine so that it only went off when a very strong magnet was over the top of it and they discovered by then that some German magnetic mine sweepers called sparebreakers were going around with huge electromagnets in their bows setting off mines ahead of them and he calculated just how strong uh, how weak uh, uh, the, the the signal had to how weak the trigger had to be in the mine before it would only blow up the mine sweeper and this was a very successful um, thing that he did during the war so when you say he was a, a sort of the, the picture of mediocrity himself, uh, on the other hand, he clearly had a very scientific mind. He liked to figure whatever the problem was, he'd push it uh, on some level. Yes, and, and in a, he's a curious mixture because he's he's a sort of mundane, practical person. He had no time for philosophy at all. He thought it was an uh, arguing argument for the sake of it. Uh, and yet he wasn't actually terribly sort of good with his hands. I mean, he was a theorist. Everyone called him the only person who's paid to do theory in biology. He did a couple of experiments himself, very good ones, but mostly he, he, he thought about things. And yet what he thought about was practical and down-to-earth and, and, and detailed, if, if you see what I mean. So he, he's hovering on this border between theory and practice, which I think is what makes him such a great achiever. Was he at all concerned with the sort of uh, morality of the application of his discoveries? I mean, you mentioned this minesweeper, which, as you say, was a particularly kind of clever and cruel little device. Um, uh, and uh, then you obviously DNA and its structures have come to be at the heart of all kinds of controversies in the, in, 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 in the meantime. Did he have religious views? How did this all figure for him? Or was well, it irrelevant? Um, uh, I think he was queasy about his role in, in, in weapons of war. Certainly he didn't want to go on working them in peacetime. That's why he wanted to get back in, in, into, into science. Um, uh, on the other hand, he had pretty straightforward uh, views that science was a good thing, uh, religion, mysticism, uh, vitalism in all their forms were a bad thing, and he wanted to shed light on the dark corners of, of uh, where, where mystery still lurked in human affairs. And he made that decision very early in his life, and, and he actually um, refused to go to church after the age of 12. So, you know, he was someone with strong views uh, along the lines of materialism, reductionism, humanism, and all that kind of thing. Um, he revealed in the 1970s a, a streak of sympathy for eugenics that surprised me when I discovered just how far-reaching it went and he thought that there was a real problem with people with inferior genes uh, breeding too much and something should be done to stop them having so many children and he doesn't seem to have thought through the practical implications of this which is the amount of human misery you 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 cause if you try and make the um the end uh, try and pursue the end instead of the means if you like which is improving the population instead of um uh, looking at, at individual decisions but he never actually achieved i mean this was just arguing that he never actually um, and i'm speaking with matt ridley the author of francis crick discoverer of the genetic code uh part of the eminent lives series uh and one of the, the 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 things that's so striking is as you say his partnership with with watson um he uh i gather that a lot of people in his family in the crick family had died young a lot of the men and and that he might have felt a certain sense of urgency and then he finds these partners with whom to work did he remain close with them did i mean they spent all this time um the relationship with watson is fascinating because uh they 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 remained great friends and, until their death but their friendship went through some periods of very severe strain um Immediately after the double helix, funnily enough, it was Watson who didn't want Crick boasting about and publicising their discovery. He thought uh, that that was uh, that was dangerous and 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 uh, demeaning in some way. And they had a big bust up about that. Uh, Fifteen years later, the boot was on the other foot when Watson produced the famous book, *The Double*.